afternoon and welcome. I am Dr. Bill Barker, the director of the Center for Faith and Inquiry here at Gordon College. And it is my delight to welcome all of you to the third and final event in this year's Herman Lecture Series on Faith and Science in honor of Dr. Robert Herman. Now, the last two nights, we've been very privileged and fortunate to have Dr. Herman and his wife uh, with us tonight. I know that they're not able to be here, um, but we are really glad to be doing this uh, in honor of Dr. Robert Herman and all of his contributions. Now, for our final lecture today, we will hear from Dr. Jennifer Wiseman on the topic of is the universe filled with life? And I was thinking about this today, and just to recap a bit of our time together, yesterday we heard about the possible origins of the universe many billions of years ago. Today we will talk about new possibilities for the potential for life elsewhere in the universe. And I thought, you know, in layman's terms, this means that yesterday was all about a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and today will be all about boldly going where no one has gone before. So there you have it. Um, that was a joke, scientists, I know, Friday. It's trying to loosen you up a little bit. All right, so in other words, uh, today uh, we will have the keynote lecture followed by a 10-minute response. We're really fortunate to have uh, Professor Emeritus from Harvard University, Dr. Owen Gingrich, giving the response. He will be Skyped in. He could not be here in person. He is away at a conference, and so we will be uh, Skyping him in for this, and we're very thankful for that. So uh, before we begin, and we have the, uh, the lecture, the response, and our brief Q&A session, uh, I want to share with you a little bit about uh, our respondent as well as our lecturer. Uh, and as I said, uh, Dr. Owen Gingrich, if you're not familiar with Professor Gingrich, Professor Emeritus of Astronomy and the History of Science at Harvard University and a Senior Astronomer Emeritus at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. In 1992 to 1993, he chaired Harvard's History of Science Department. Professor Gingrich's interests have ranged from the recomputation of an ancient Babylonian mathematical table to the interpretation of stellar spectra. He is the co-author of two successive standard models for the solar atmosphere, he is the first to take into account rocket and satellite observations of the sun. And the second of these papers that he published on this topic received over 700 literature citations. In the past decades, Professor Gingrich has become a leading authority on the 17th century German astronomer Johannes Kepler and on Nicholas Copernicus. In recognition of his studies in these areas, he was awarded the Polish government's Order of Merit in 1981 and subsequently an asteroid was named after Professor Gingrich uh, in his honor. Uh, Professor Gingrich has been vice president of the American Philosophical Society, that's America's oldest scientific academy. He has served as chairman of the U.S. National Committee of the International Astronomical Union, served as counselor of the American Astronomical Society, and helped organize its historical astronomy division. Among numerous other uh, awards, fellowships, and prizes. He is also the author of over 200 technical research articles and 300 reviews. Uh, he has also written 250 educational encyclopedia articles. Um, and in 1984, he was one of the first to win the Harvard Radcliffe Phi Beta Kappa Prize for Excellence in Teaching. So we are really thrilled to have Dr. Gingrich giving the response today. For our keynote speaker, we've said a lot about her in the last two days, and we will uh, say it once more uh, how thrilled we are to have Dr. Jennifer Wiseman here with us. Uh, she is an astronomer, an author, a speaker. She studies the process of star and planet formation in our galaxy using radio, optical, and infrared telescopes, and she has worked with several major national observatories. She's also interested in national science policy and public science engagement, and she directs the program of dialogue on science, ethics, and religion for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Among her many accomplishments, she discovered Comet Wiseman Skiff in 1987, served as Jansky Fellow at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, served as a Hubble Fellow at the Johns Hopkins University, and a Congressional Science Fellow of the American Physical Society, uh, which worked with the staff of the Science Committee of the United States House of Representatives. She's also a Fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation. Dr. Wiseman is currently a senior astrophysicist with NASA. She has authored several essays addressing the relationship of astronomy and faith. She frequently gives talks to churches, schools, civic and campus groups on the excitement of scientific discovery. Once again, will you please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman.
Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Once again, it's a, it's a great honor for me to be here at Gordon College and uh, to give these lectures. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I'm also very appreciative uh, to the Hermans and to, to everyone, uh, to the John Templeton Foundation for support of, of this series. So uh, let's uh, start with talking about where we've been the last couple of days and talking about the universe. Um, how many of you have been to one of the other lectures I gave? One or both of them, yes. Oh, good, okay, so I have some repeat customers. So we're gonna uh, do just a tiny bit of review. Tonight, I wanna focus on whether, whether and how we know if the universe is actually filled with life. Um, cosmic bounty, as I put it. But let's do a little retrospect first on where we come this week. First, we talk about uh, beauty and wonder and awe and how the universe is filled with activity and things that are boggling to the mind. I like to keep showing this image because it reminds us that stars are not boring. This, this cluster of stars uh, so exquisitely imaged by a new camera on the Hubble Space Telescope shows us that stars are not all the same. They're different from one another. They are different colors, different brightnesses. They have different histories, different compositions. And so scientifically they're interesting, but they're also interesting to us. We connect on a level of, of beauty and a sense of amazement at the numbers of stars uh, that can fill uh, the galaxy and the universe as a whole. We've learned about the beauty of places where stars are born, places this, where stars form in interstellar clouds, uh, where these activities continue on even today, and they would be unnoticed if we did not have the kinds of telescopes and technology that we now have so that we can see things that people in generations before us did not have the privilege of seeing. So it's a great connection between technology, human curiosity, and what's actually happening in the universe in which we live. I keep mentioning both nights that I want to show you a little clip about how images from space can actually inspire people, uh, people of faith. And one way this is represented sometimes is through the imagery of space that can actually be displayed in places of worship. I've mentioned the space window at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., which commemorates different aspects of exploration. I also wanted to mention uh, that many of the images that are taken from space telescopes, such as the Hubble Space Telescope seen here, are inspiring to people. And uh, this telescope is operating right now. It's orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. It's whipping around the planet. And it is taking enormously beautiful images and transmitting them down to Earth. People have been inspired by images from telescopes like this for many years. Hubble has been operating for 26 years, and it has inspired people um, everywhere, but in particular at uh, St. Paul the Apostles Catholic Church, which is near Johnson Space Center, uh, that congregation decided to put images from the Hubble Space Telescope in their stained glass windows to inspire their congregation. Uh, many of their congregants are actually involved in the space program, even astronauts. So I would like to show you this little four-minute clip from, uh, of interviews from the church where we can get a sense of why this congregation chose to, uh, to do this and what it means to them. So we'll see if this works here. Let me just uh, uh, turn this on and see if we can hear it. We are at uh, St. Paul's Catholic Church in uh, Nassau Bay, also referred to as St. Paul the Apostle. We're about two blocks from Nassau. Some of the astronauts actually went to church here, in which we are very proud. In 2005, we developed a building committee to start working on building our new church. We knew in the beginning that we wanted to 
connect our parish with something from NASA because so many of our parishioners that come here have worked for NASA or space-related contractors and industries. We spoke with our liturgical designer and said, how can we incorporate something from the heavens? And our liturgical designer came up with these celestial windows and that we would choose an image from the Hubble telescope I was the uh, lead flight director on the STS-31 shuttle mission that deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. The objective was to get it as high as we could get it with the shuttle, which was about 300 nautical miles uh, above the Earth, so that you could get the telescope above most of the Earth's atmosphere, so the imagery wouldn't be distorted by any of the atmosphere. Those of us that worked to deploy a mission and put the telescope up there were really on a high after we completed the mission and successfully deployed the, the telescope. And then when the first images came back, they were spectacular. I got on the, the headset and, and I told the flight control team at that time, I said, uh, you all have no idea what we have just done. Uh, this telescope will rewrite the astronomy books. I am not an astronomer, and, and I'm not in the science end of it. I'm just a domo engineer responsible for, <laughs> for operations. The imagery, though, was just spectacular. When you're here on Earth, you, you look at the sky at night, and it's just dark, and you see the, the stars that you can see, and you just don't realize things like these, what you see on these windows is, is really there. And the other beauty of the telescope is when you're looking at space with the telescope, you're looking back in time. You know, the, the light from the stars that we see on the Earth left the star hundreds of thousands of years ago. Well, I think when we look at the perfection of space itself in the universe, it almost brings us to the entire ideal of, of a God, of an orderly God, a God who is great. And so that spiritual uplifting comes from the Space Center and the work that they're doing and how close they come in contact uh, with God as they venture out into space. And they realize the magnitude of the universe and the magnitude of God. And I think that's brought back into St. Paul the Apostle Church with that perspective, is that our God is so magnificent and so great that it lifts us spiritually. As we look towards the heavens in that, we could almost feel the presence of God. I was very happy for all of the men and women who worked at NASA and for their families who sacrificed quite a bit in the last 50 years to achieve what we have in our space program. And I was very happy for them that in some way we could honor them in that way within our worship space. So I thought that was just a very interesting, um, inspiring piece about how images from space can actually create a sense of appreciation for God, a deeper sense of reverence, a d deeper sense of, of praise. And it doesn't even have to be images from space. I think it can be any, any sense of God's work that can deepen our sense of reverence and praise. We learned over the last couple of days by looking at some of these inspiring images that our universe is beautiful, it's active, it's enormous, and it's progressive. And I don't necessarily mean that term in a political sense. I don't think the universe has a political party. But, but it's, it's changing and, and, and moving over the, the period of, of the universe's existence to a point where life can exist and thrive we looked at some of that activity when we looked, uh, for the benefit of those of you who weren't here the last couple of days, we looked at activity in our own solar system, like Jupiter, where you can see both the atmospheric bands and you can see 
an ultraviolet light, the aurora uh, that are dancing around based on the magnetic field changes around the planet. We looked outside our solar system at familiar star regions like Orion and noticing that if you take a large image from the ground, such as this beautiful picture that shows the whole region, and you zoom in on some of these nebular regions with a telescope that can give you much higher angular resolution, like the Hubble Space Telescope, you see this kind of detail, colorful wonder, beauty in the clouds, and that the colors are lit up or, or created when stars that have recently formed out of this interstellar gas turn on. And those stars send out powerful photons in the surrounding gas, ionizing that gas and making it visible in the beautiful colors that we can see. We learned that stars are basically just collapsed balls of gas that form continuously out of these uh, interstellar clouds when there's an eddy of gas that's got enough density to collapse due to its own gravitational pull. We learned that when stars turn on, they can carve out their surrounding environment from their winds and their radiation, creating these big pillar-like structures that we often see in these interstellar clouds, these majestic structures, um, like this one as well, the Horsehead Nebula, which is beautiful here seen uh, with an infrared camera, so you can see more of the dusty emission in the region. And we learned that these clouds of gas and dust can fill the volume of these collections we call galaxies. Galaxies are held together, again, by the mutual gravitational pull of all the mass within them. They contain, and by volume, mostly gas and dust, but by mass, they're mostly filled with, there can be hundreds of billions of stars and galaxies like this. This is a beautiful spiral galaxy. Um, there's so many stars that the light blends together in the core, showing that beautiful glow. And we think our own Milky Way looks something like this beautiful spiral. We learned that as stars form, they can do spectacular things. This is the, the, the bipolar jet coming from a star in the process of formation, buried in that central dense dust cloud but that as material falls in, it can get uh, tangled up in magnetic fields around that young baby star and actually expelled in these spectacular jets that go back out into the surrounding environment. And we learned that older stars also expel their material. We learned from the Butterfly Nebula as an example that old stars, after the, the hydrogen in their cores, gets uh, much used up through this process of fusion that's creating the starlight that the star can become unstable, and part of that instability actually launches the outer atmospheres in these spectacular ways, in this case a bipolar flow that makes it look like a butterfly, hence we call it the Butterfly Nebula. We learned that even bigger stars, stars bigger than our sun, as they run out of their inner fuel, they become even more unstable and they will actually explode in something called a supernova, a spectacular explosion Seen here, the debris from an explosion that happened about a thousand years ago. And the colors here represent different elements that were actually forged in the star. Starlight, as we learned the last couple of days, is the product of a reaction in the middle of this very dense collapsed cloud of gas, where most of the gas, which is hydrogen, has been compressed into a very tight space in the core, creating heat and pressure and if there's enough heat and pressure, hydrogen atoms in the core of this protostar will start a reaction called fusion. And when hydrogen atoms fuse together, they become helium atoms, and they also release photons of light, which eventually escape, and that's what starlight is. That's what our sun is doing. It's a little fusion reactor. So, the process. But also heavier elements, as time goes on, become uh, forged in these same fusion furnaces, things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, eventually iron. These elements are forged and then they too are expelled when stars reach the end of their lives and they go back into the interstellar clouds and then the next generation of stars that forms picks up some of that heavier material. It gets caught up in the star, which is still mostly hydrogen, but it also enables solid material, dust and debris, to form in the region around a star. 
Well, how do we know what this is made of? We talked about looking at the remnants through spectro spectroscopy. This purplish material is another debris ring of what's left over from an exploded star, a supernova remnant. And you can look anywhere in that debris, in this case just here. And if you look at that through spectroscopy, which is the science of putting light through a prism that spreads the light out into its constituent colors, you will see a spectrum of light where at some colors or wavelengths of light, you don't see much brightness at all. But at others, you see a lot of brightness. So you see kind of patterns here in the light. Some colors, there's no light, and some colors, not. And a spectroscopist will look at that pattern and can interpret that as being something, in this case, uh, carbon and oxygen being emitted. Light from those elements are in that debris that we're observing with the telescope. That tells us that carbon and oxygen were forged in that star that eventually exploded. Or in some cases, some elements are created through the chemical reactions that happen in the explosion and instability process itself. These heavier elements, again, are dispersed out into the interstellar medium and can get caught up in the next generation of stars. Well, what happens as you have several generations of stars forming in these regions is that this heavier material can become more substantial. Here's back in the core of the Orion Nebula, which I showed earlier, lit up by massive stars that have recently formed. But there are lower mass stars that are still trying to form in this gas. Here's a couple of them blown up so you can see them better. One of them you see face on here. One of them you see edge on. And the, the hot heating up protostar is the red dot in the middle of these things. But that darker shroud around these objects is a disk of dusty debris. And it's about the diameter of our own solar system, right, for these objects. So we have now learned in the past decade or so that as stars form in our epoch, of, they almost always form with these dusty disks of debris. These are dust particles of different sizes. Um, they can coalesce into larger particles. We now know these are the sites where planets actually form, that stars and planets actually form together. This is another image. It's an actual disk uh, of debris or dust around a young star that's in the process of forming. Now, this image was taken with a radio telescope observatory. You see down in the bottom this collection of radio telescopes in South America. And they have worked together. It's called interferometry. When you use radio telescopes together, you can get very sharp images. And you can see things like dust and, and through dense regions that regular optical telescopes wouldn't be able to see through. And here we see a region. You can't really see the individual star in the middle, but it's in there. And around it, you see this large disk of dust. And you see that it's in the, in the shape of rings. And scientists now understand that rings are structures that are actually formed and carved out when you have something orbiting um, the larger body in the center. We see this in Saturn. Saturn has rings, and we know that the ring structure is actually influenced by Saturn's moons, which are orbiting Saturn. So it's thought that perhaps this system has rings that are being shaped and influenced by the presence of orbiting planets in the system. It's very hard to see planets. Let me get my pointer out here so we can uh, look at things a little more carefully here. It's very hard to see planets around other stars because they are so small. So a lot of times astronomers have to uh, resort to looking at evidence, other evidence for planets, and I'll talk about some of that soon as well. But we know now there are planets around other stars. Here's a star and six planets orbiting it. This is not a picture, this is an artist's conception, because again, I said it's very difficult to actually take a picture of planets around other stars. But this is a real system that was discovered with the Kepler telescope. It was discovered because um, it was seen that something was transiting in front of this planet regularly, meaning there were planets orbiting the star regularly, and the starlight was periodically dimming a little bit every time one of these planets would orbit in front. And through this method, astronomers can actually characterize what is actually orbiting the star.
how many objects and how large they are. We know uh, also, to feed into the rest of this talk, remember that we talked about the fact that the universe is enormous. Not only do we have individual galaxies like our own and like this one, but we learned that the universe is filled with whole galaxies. It's, it's enormous, both in space and time. We now know that galaxies like this are not unique and that um, starting just about a century ago, even a little less, astronomers began to realize that there were galaxies outside our own galaxy. And in fact, now we know there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. Here's that ultra deep field I've shown uh, both nights now, and you've seen, you've, some of you got a, an image of this to take home yesterday, but this is the deep exposure of the Space Telescope, space collecting light and finding that there are galaxies filling space. Every little dot here almost is not a star in our own galaxy, but is another exterior galaxy, um, some containing hundreds of billions of stars. And this just is a tiny soda straw area of space. Imagining it extrapolated over the whole sky can actually blow your mind. And now, tonight, I want us to think a little bit more about what's in these galaxies, remembering that some of them are closer to us, some of them are farther away, they're filled with stars. Could those stars also have planets, just like our sun has planets? We learned also that as we get better and better cameras on our telescopes, we can see fainter and fainter objects in space as the camera's sensitive. So this chart represents, as telescopes or cameras on the telescopes get better, we can see farther into deep space. And that correlates with seeing back in time, because the farther you look in space, the longer it's taken for the light to get to the telescope from whatever you're looking at. And so that means when we look back uh, for billions of light years in the distance, a light year for an astronomer is a unit of distance. It's the amount, it's the distance that light travels in one year, we're now looking back millions and even billions of light years away. So we're looking at things as they were millions or even billions of years in the past when the light began its journey. And we've learned that the young galaxies from far back in time look different from the galaxies of our own epoch. They're smaller, they haven't merged together yet with other galaxies to grow and they haven't yet had those generations of stars coming and going and producing those heavier elements. So if the beginning of time is off here off to the right, the, the spectacular beginning of our universe, then time would march from right to left here to our present day. And our telescopes are now getting good enough that we're seeing these early galaxies um, not forming not too long after the beginning of the universe itself. And we finally found that by comparing galaxies from our nearby epoch of time, meaning within uh, you know, a few billion years ago, to, to galaxies from over 10 billion years ago, we can see that galaxies are not all the same. The early baby galaxies are smaller, they haven't yet merged together, and then generations of stars have enriched the composition of these more mature galaxies. And those stars, and potentially their planetary systems, have those heavier elements, such as our own Earth has, um, if the stars in these galaxies indeed have planets. So, culminating what we've learned the last two nights, we've learned that the universe is beautiful and inspiring, We've also learned that it's developed over time and it continues to mature and change with the production of stars, heavier elements, and planets providing conditions needed for life to thrive on at least one planet, all right? We know there's life here. Would everyone agree that there's life on this planet, all right? Would anyone agree that there's intelligent life on this planet? All right, might have a little discord there. Um, does this imply purpose? Last night we, dis we went on into this philosophical question, not a scientific question, but does the fact that the universe seems to have progressed into a habitable place, does it imply that there's purpose built into the system? That's a philosophical and theological question. 
and different people have different conclusions. But tonight, let's talk about whether the universe is bountiful in terms of planets and life. We know there are hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy. So this is a pic an image from a telescope on the ground that's looking toward the center of our own galaxy. You see lots of stars, you see lots and lots of dust and gas toward the center of our galaxy. And the point of this image is just to show you that stars are abundant and only one of them in our Milky Way galaxy is our sun. So could there be uh, life or other planets around other stars, and of course the life question. Um, if you count the number of stars in our own galaxy, a few hundred million, and then you multiply that by the number of galaxies that we now know are in the observable universe, this being an image of galaxies, we find out that if there's something on the order of 200 billion galaxies in the universe and 200 billion stars in each one, on average, you get an enormous number of stars, all right? Some, some, something like 10 to the 24th power, give or take a few, uh, a few times that. So uh, there's a lot of stars, all right? Why are there so many stars, all right? That's a scientific question and a philosophical question. I don't know the answer. There's a lot of stars. Our sun is just one of them. Is it likely that our sun is the only star system that has planets and the only system that could have life? A lot of people would say, well, that doesn't seem likely, but how do we know? Are there other planets in the universe? Um, is there another Earth out there? Could there be life? This is an image of Earth looking back from the moon. When astronauts went to the moon, they looked back, and for the first time, humanity got to see our home planet as a whole, and kind of think about what that means. We're all inhabitants of one planet, and it's a beautiful planet. We're looking around for life in our own solar system on other planets. Many people have speculated for, for many years as to whether there could be life on Mars, civilizations even. We've now, we're now pretty sure through our uh, rovers and probes of Mars that there is not advanced life on Mars at present, but we have rovers digging around on Mars to look at the frost and the ice underneath the, the, the surface dust to see if there could be evidence of microbial life even from the past, maybe the present. This is not Mars. This is an image of Europa. This is a moon of Jupiter, which is also an exciting place to think about the potentialities of life in our own solar system. Why? Because Europa is an ice-covered moon, but we think because of its orbital position around Jupiter and the tugs and pulls that it has on the system that its core may be continually hot and heating up from the inside, this moon, so that you can have melted water beneath the ice crust. You could have an ocean underneath the ice well, where there's water on planet Earth, there's life. And so the question is, could there be at least microbial life in the oceans of Europa? And how would you study that? You'd have to send some kind of probe that maybe could drill down potentially hundreds of miles under the ice to sample that water. And of course, you don't want to contaminate that water. So there are people thinking about that. But more recently, there's been a kind of exciting a uh, precursor to that kind of complicated probe mission, which is that looking at Europa, this is a, an image from, from the Galileo probe that went to the Jupiter system, but looking at it with the Hubble Space Telescope, these interesting little features were seen recently and also analyzed with a spectroscopic science instrument on Hubble, and it turns out these are plumes potentially of water vapor being expelled from between the cracks in Europa's ice. So if we can actually test the water under the ice by looking at water and water vapor that's being expelled, it's easier to do that. We could at least have a preliminary study with some other probe that comes and kind of samples or studies the water to see um, if Europa could be habitable and maybe even see if the water itself could be habitable or even inhabited. So people are excited about this. It's very preliminary, but uh, there, there's, there's ideas of looking around the solar system for either present simple life or life that may have existed in the past. 
We haven't found any yet, but the curiosity is there. What about looking outside of our solar system, around other stars? Are there Earth's Earth-like planets or habitable worlds beyond our sun? And of course, this begs these deeper questions. Where do we fit into this universe? Are we alone? What can science tell us about our place in the universe? And what kinds of questions are beyond science that science can't tell us? Well, here's our sample system. This one, again, was detected, and this is the artist's conception of real dis detections from the Kepler Space Telescope, which is a different kind of space telescope. Kepler uh, um, has contributed to our knowledge of the number of planets in our solar system in, at an amazing rate. So way back when I was in uh, college and graduate school in the 80s and 90s, the number, the count of these planets outside of our solar system, we call exoplanets, was zero, okay? So uh, we didn't know of any planets beyond, outside of our solar system. And uh, so, so you live in a profound time. There was lots of speculation through science fiction and through writings that there could be life elsewhere, lots of philosophical and, and uh, imaginations of finding planets and potentially life beyond our solar system, but we didn't know of a single one. And then as the technology and the methodologies improved, these planets orbiting other stars began to be detected, first with a lot of uncertainty and then more and more and more. So the number of planets detected each year began to grow and grow to the point where we were discovering hundreds of planets every year outside of our solar system. This chart goes up to, to uh, June of last year where over a thousand were discovered. Um, and then the chart just grows and grows. So I haven't updated this chart, but you get the idea. There's an explosion of discovery just in the last few years of actual planets outside of our solar system. We don't know much about them because we detect most of them indirectly, but uh, we're learning more and more. And of course, we've been looking at some of these more distant systems, and then just this year, we found out through uh, telescopes working from the ground that actually the closest stars to us, which are Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri, Proxima Centauri uh, has a planet in the habitable zone, which means that this planet is not so close to the star that it could that all the water would boil away and not so far away that all any water would freeze. So we may have a habitable planet in our own solar neighborhood. These stars are just four light years away, which astronomically speaking is very close. They're our nearest neighbor. So nearest neighbor star system that contains Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri. And now we know there's a planet that's very interesting around Proxima Centauri. We don't know much about it yet except that it's in a potentially habitable situation around its parent star. Now, of course, artists can uh, go to town with this. So this is what, uh, Proxima, what uh, this artist thinks that it would look like if you were on Proxima Centauri looking at your parent star there. This is a small star, so the habitable zone is actually close in, <coughs> and the star would look pretty bright in the sky. And you would also see another star, Alpha Centauri, off in the distance. All right, so how many planets are there? Um, it turns out that a few years ago, someone had the wild estimation that there might be five billion planetary systems. But as our Kepler telescope and other telescopes gathered more data, it seemed that that was an underestimate, so that there's 20 billion planetary systems within our galaxy. And then that became an underestimate. Maybe there's at least 100 billion planetary systems within our galaxy. And now, by looking at the statistics, it appears that on average, every star in our galaxy has one planet on average. So that means some stars don't have any planets, and some stars, like our sun, have more than one planet, but that planets are very common, all right? This is amazing, all right? We didn't know this until just the last, you know, three years or something, so you live in a very interesting time. 
Well, how do we detect these planets? I, I mentioned there are indirect techniques. Let me tell you a little bit more about the, the technicalities of looking for these planets because they're very small. A planet is a small object next to a very bright star. How do you see such a thing? Even with good telescopes, it's very challenging. We have to use these detective techniques. So one way is that you look on t at tugging motions on the star. So if a planet is orbiting a star, they're actually both responding to each other's gravity, and they're both actually orbiting something called the center of mass or the center of gravity between those two objects, which tends to be located somewhere in the region within the star. So the star just wobbles while the planet orbits around. And if you can't see the planet, if you have very careful detection devices for looking at the star, you can actually see the star wobbling. That was the technique where the first uh, quite a few hundreds of exoplanets were discovered, which is by looking at the wobble of stars. Um, Doppler shifting is one way of measuring that stellar wobble, that the particular light frequencies from the star will change a little bit if the star is moving away from you or toward you, at least in the way you receive it. And so if it's a little bit bluer than it ought to be, it means that the thing is moving toward you. If it's a little bit redder, it means the object is moving away from you. And if you see this periodically changing from red shifting to blue shifting, you know that what you're looking at is wobbling. All right. Another indirect way is looking for transits. That means if the planet around the star happens to be orbiting along your line of sight, you know, it could be in any orientation orbiting that star, but if it happens to be that you're looking at the star and the planet is orbiting along your line of sight, every orbit that planet will come in front of the star and block out a little bit of the starlight. So those eclipses or transits we call actually cause the received starlight to dip a little bit and you can tell something about the kind of planet transiting by measuring the amount of starlight dip. And of course the third option is what you'd really like to do is take a picture, image the planet, but that's difficult because you have to somehow suppress that glare from the bright starlight nearby. And you can also see the wobble in the plane of the sky uh, moving around and around. That's, that's a little bit harder for astronomers because you have to have very, very precise, what we call astrometry, but it is another method that can be used in some cases. Here's an example of telescopes used from the ground that were used uh, by this wobbling technique to discover many of these exo exoplanets. Um, this team of, of uh, Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler discovered hundreds of these extrasolar planets using these telescopes, the Keck telescopes and the Anglo-Australian telescope. Uh, to find many, many of these and to perfect the technique. Pictorially, this is what it looks like, although this is not to scale, okay? So this is a, extremely exaggerated. But if, you look, if you're looking at a star, what you're really interested in is the planet, but the planet in many cases is too small to see. But if the planet is orbiting the star, you can actually see the star wobbling a little bit because of that mutual gravitational tug. And as the star is wobbling in its wobble, is moving toward the telescope, it emits light, but the light received, um, every pulse of light is a little bit closer to the pulse before it than would be if the, if the object were stationary. This is called Doppler shifting. So you see it a little bit bluer when the, when the star is wobbling towards you and a little bit redder when the star is wobbling away. And if you see this frequency change periodically, you can tell something about what's causing that wobble and you can actually estimate the mass of the planet that's tugging on the star. And you can even get fancy and estimate whether there's more than one planet based on the signal that you receive that way. If you wanna actually take a picture of the light, you need to block out the starlight and that's hard, um, but we do have growing better and better technologies called coronagraphs, which are designed to block out the star that light. They were designed to study the corona of the sun by blocking out the sunlight so you can see the outer fringing activity around the surface of the sun. But we can also use coronagraphs to block out the light from other stars to look at things around them. So here's our scientist with a coronagraph about to block out that starlight 
And then you see the happy planet suddenly appear that you weren't able to see before. Um, and then, let's see, okay, yeah, happy planet, okay, here we go, happy, happy sun, happy planet. All right, got it? Um, and we're developing technologies for future telescopes that will be even more sophisticated at blocking out the glow from these types of, of uh, stars. If you think of stars like a lighthouse, you know, they're bright things, they can be a billion times brighter than maybe an Earth-sized planet around them. So that's kind of like looking um, li at a firefly around a lighthouse. So that's what you see there is a firefly hidden in the glare of the lighthouse. That's the challenge astronomers face. But it can be done. Here, for example, in some systems, when the planets are big enough and, and far enough away from the parent star, a coronagraph can block out the starlight and reveal the planet. So here's a system with several planets, HR 8799, where uh, from one big telescope on the ground, the Gemini telescope was able to employ its coronagraph to block out the starlight adequately enough to see the planets, these being huge Jupiter-like planets, not like Earth, but nevertheless it demonstrates the technique. And then the transit method that I told you about, when the planet, here's our star, here's our planet that happens to be orbiting along the line of sight to us, so as the planet goes in front of the parent star, it blocks out some of the light from the star, so down here is the total light that we're receiving from the star. Suddenly it dropped a little bit because some of it's being blocked out. That makes the star unhappy. Um, but then as the planet goes to the other side, the total amount of light jumps up. So this is the transit method that the Kepler Space Telescope used uh, for some years, just a few years ago, to study hundreds of thousands of stars and to come up with the statistics. That's how we know that most stars on average have one planet. Um, here's a kind of graphic of what transits look like. The chart on the bottom is the total starlight received. It drops when something's blocking it and then it goes back up again. We'd like to know even more specifics. We'd like to know what fraction of stars in our galaxy harbor not only any kind of planet, but potentially habitable Earth-sized planets, because we, we know that there's quite a few of these big gas giant planets, but how many planets are more like Earth with, that, that aren't smothered by a huge atmosphere, that actually have the potential for oceans and continents and life? Um, the search is very active to find out. Uh, some of the systems that Kepler discovered are quite odd. This is a, this is a, a an artist's conception, again, of a real system discovered where a planet is orbiting binary stars, two stars. And uh, those of you who remember uh, the first Star Wars movie will remember Luke Skywalker looking out at that uh, double star sunset. What about life on these planets? So one of astronomy's highest goals right now is to develop the, te the uh, telescopes and technology to directly detect and characterize these Earth-like planets within the next decade or two, but also to look for signs of, of life, or I should say first habitability, whether there are places where life could exist, and then potentially even signs of life itself, especially primitive life. I mean, we're always jumping to the question of whether there are civilizations, and of course that's an important question, but Astronomers would be very excited if we found evidence for even simple life uh, beyond Earth and other planetary systems. Now, some organizations are actually looking first for the intelligent life. So you've heard of the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They're already listening for intentional signals from intelligent civilizations. And that's, uh, that's interesting in its own right. So we have Scientists, uh, most of whom are looking for evidence of habitability, even for simple life around exoplanets, and then other programs actually interested in finding uh, intentional signals from advanced life. All of this going on at the same time. So, as you just heard, hot off the press, we know that planets are common. We didn't know that just a few years ago, so this is very new. But if the goal is to find planets with evidence of life, most of these planets that have been detected so far are really not good candidates. 
Most of them are either too close to their parent star, so they'd be very hot, all the water would boil away. And right now, as far as we understand, biologically speaking, all life needs some connection to liquid water. Or they're too cold, they're too far away from their parent star, so any liquid water would be frozen out. Um, some, though, may be just right, temperature-wise. They might be in what's called the habitable zone of their star. Now, there's also other issues. Are they around a, a friendly star or a star that has violent flares? Do they have a circular orbit or an odd kind of elongated elliptical orbit? Would they be holding on to a good atmosphere or not? This, these are other questions that go into the habitability uh, science. We also have realized that different sizes of stars have their habitable zone in different distances from the star. So a hot star, you'd have to get farther away. This is the distance from the star here. And this green zone is the distance from the star that might be habitable if planets were in that zone. So we've discovered a few planets in this habitable zone. But for the big hot stars, that zone is farther away. And for the smaller cool stars, that zone is closer in. And in fact, most stars are smaller than our sun. Most stars are what we call these dwarf stars. So we've realized that uh, maybe instead of looking for sun-like stars and planets around them, we should be looking at these dwarf stars, which are more plentiful. And maybe when we look at their planets um, that are closer in, we might have a better chance of finding habitable world. So that's another hot search topic in astronomy, building telescopes to look for planets around dwarf stars, cool stars. How are we going to know if a planet supports life? This is this whole new science of astrobiology. So it's, it's the idea of trying to understand life on Earth in all its extreme conditions in a better way so that we'll, we'll know how to recognize it elsewhere. You see, these planetary systems, these exoplanets, are around other stars. At least for now, we have no way of going to those systems to actually sample and look for life. We can only observe them remotely with telescopes. So what will we look for remotely to find out if there's life? If we look back at Earth from a distance, we can tell there's biological activity going on here. Um, we can look for evidence of oxygen, for example, on planet Earth. All the plant life uh, produced by things like, uh, or all the, 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 the plants and algae and so forth are producing oxygen. Oxygen is continually being replenished in our atmosphere. So oxygen would be a good biomarker, a good sign for biological activity. We would look for evidence of liquid water. It doesn't mean that there's life just because there's liquid water, but it's one of those components that makes it more promising. Um, we would look for reflected light off that planet to see if the planet has some kind of a, an atmosphere that would be uh, uh, detectable in the spectrum of light from the, from the reflections, as we can tell from Earth. And then on Earth, some living organisms actually produce methane. In particular, our livestock actually produces a detectable amount of methane in the atmosphere. So we would look for signs of that elsewhere and see if there's a bovine planet somewhere outside the Earth. <laughs> So these are examples of biomarkers, and of course you have to rule out, if you see them, some other non-biotic explanation for these signals. Um, again, this is the whole science of astrobiology coming into play here, and it's a new science um, that's, that's funded now by NASA and some of the other science foundations. And most scientists who are astrobiologists are actually studying conditions on Earth and extreme conditions to find out what kinds of adaptations life can do to live on this planet and how you might detect it somewhere else. Okay, we did this already. We might actually see, though, if we look at another planet, that it's at a different stage from our planet Earth. Our Earth's atmosphere has looked different over the years. Um, what would it look like if we looked at an Earth-like planet, but that is a very different age or stage than the current Earth? We know, for example, that very simple organisms called methanogens and cyanobacteria have been around on the Earth since it was young. Um, the Earth, most scientists believe the Earth is about four and a half billion years old, and we can see fossil evidence of some of these 
simple creatures from within that first uh, billion years of its existence, and, and advanced life didn't actually come onto the scene until later, and our atmosphere has changed significantly. So if today is on the right here, and four and a half billion years is over to the left, the concentration of these different gases in our atmosphere has changed from being dominated by carbon dioxide um, in the early history to being dominated by oxygen now, uh, and of course nitrogen and other components, uh, oxygen being a product of life. So if we look at it from our, uh, uh, if we look at our Earth now from a distance, we see a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, but if we look it's like planet that was in an earlier stage, we might see a different mix of gases uh, in the atmosphere. So we have to think about that as well. And then there's the philosophical and theological questions. So the last part of my talk is going to take us from this science and where we are in detecting these exoplanets and doing crude analyses of their atmospheres. We've already found through our telescopes that there's water vapor on many of these exoplanets in their atmospheres. We're now building future telescopes that will be even more sensitive to do some of these other analyses of atmospheres. And so scientists are really excited about the next generation of telescopes that will enable us to learn even more about these exoplanets that we're discovering. The question now, theologically and philosophically, is will finding exoplanets and potentially even life beyond Earth affect our view of our own human significance? And it begs these kinds of questions. Are we, as human life on Earth, are we significant? Are we special? Are we average? Are we accidental? Are we unusual? Are we alone? What does it mean, then, to be significant? We talked about that yesterday. Do we have to be the only life in the universe to be significant? Do we have to be in a central place we learned from Copernicus a long time ago that Earth was not in the center of the solar system, um, that our solar system is not in the center of the galaxy, that the galaxy that we live in is not in the center of the universe, and in fact, we may be in a multiverse with other universes. Does that mean that we're insignificant? Um, and yet, ultimately, that Copernican revolution was found to be compatible with most faiths and cultures. So the question is, if we do find life elsewhere, Will that be compatible with our faith as well? The work of Dennis Danielson, professor of literature at the University of British, British Columbia, uh, pointed out that the Copernican Revolution in Copernican times did not have the same significance to it that we often attribute to it today. In fact, in Copernican times, being removed from the center of something didn't demote you, it actually promoted you. The center of things was considered a, 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 a dirty place, um, even a hellish place, the center of the earth. To be elevated out of that was, was uh, to be raised in significance. And in fact, not being central or unique could be interpreted not only as a loss of significance, um, but maybe even an increase in significance. That's a philosophical question, not a science question. If we find life beyond Earth, how would society respond to the detection or the non-detection of extraterrestrial life? It's a significant thing if we were to find life beyond Earth. It's also a significant thing if we find out that most of these planets that are abundant, or maybe all of them, would seem to be in ha not habitable, that would also be a significant conclusion. Um, and the question is significant even if we're talking about simple life. What if we find evidence for bacteria or some very simple life form outside of our solar system? That means that however you believe life started here, it started elsewhere as well. Would people be ready to digest this? And of course we're interested in complex intelligent life. Two, how is society going to respond to that? Well, it turns out people have been thinking about this a long, long time, all right? Even the ancient Greeks, Epicurus, uh, wrote that there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. Uh, of course, he's using the word world a little different than the way we use it today. But nevertheless, he says, we must believe that in all worlds there are living creatures and planets and other things we see in this world. People are already thinking about that. Theologian Ted Peters 
actually asked people about this, people from different religious faiths. He asked them, of course, jumping to the, 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 the detection potentially of, of, of intelligent life, he said, if we found without doubt that there are civilizations of intelligent beings living on another planet, would that undercut your faith and your beliefs? Would it cause a crisis in your belief system? And so he asked people, he asked Catholics and Protestant evangelicals and Protestant mainlines and Orthodox uh, Christians and Jewish respondents and Buddhists and Mormons and non-religious people, you know, True or false, would you agree that confirmation of a discovery of intelligent life would undercut your beliefs so badly that your beliefs would face a crisis? And nearly everybody said they know, you know, they could incorporate this. You know, if we found life elsewhere, you have to think about it a little bit, but it would fit in with my belief structure. Almost everybody, you know, a few people thought it would, a few people didn't know, but almost everybody thought they could accommodate within their existing belief structure the detection of a civilization of intelligent beings. But there's something interesting here. He also asked these groups, and I don't have a chart about this, he asked them, what about these other people, not your own faith, not your own beliefs, but these other belief groups? Will they be able to handle the detection of extraterrestrial life and civilizations? And many people said, no, no, these other belief systems will fall apart. Um, the the, the non-religious respondents said that religious belief will crumble. The religious believers felt that those who were non-believers would suddenly realize that there must be a God, you know, and, 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 and between the groups. So there's something sociological here. Everybody believes that something profound is going to happen when we detect life elsewhere, and it's going to disrupt the belief systems of the world, just not their own. It will disrupt other people's. So uh, they're kind of interesting thoughts there. Um, even ancient uh, historic Islam talked about the idea of God having the power to create thousands and thousands of worlds beyond this world. All right, so this has been thought about in different religions and different cultures. What about Christian theology? Would Christian theology embrace the idea of life on other planets, simple life or intelligent, even intelligent life? Well, there's been some thought about this. More recently, just in November a few years ago, 2009, the uh, Catholic Church held a conference on astrobiology, the Vatican's uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and they brought in scientists and theologians to talk about this. Now, this cartoon, which might be seen as not complimentary, but it was kind of funny, it came out in the Washington Post around that time that uh, that, that conference was held. But the director of the Vatican Observatory was asked, you know, why are you doing this? Um, and he said, why is the Vatican involved in astrobiology? He said, although astrobiology is an emerging field and still a developing subject, the questions of life's origins and, whatever, and whether life exists elsewhere in the universe are very interesting and deserve serious consideration. They offer many, these questions offer many philosophical and theological implications. What theological implications? Well, uh, those of you here know these things, but, uh, but basically in Christian thought, and I'm no theologian, so this is like kindergarten Christian theology here, but in Christian thought, we believe that creation is good by whatever may, means God has brought it about, um, whether by special instant creation or using evolutionary creation means, whatever, however God created things, it's good. And God is the author of it. And that God loves his creation. God loves people. And furthermore, that humans reflect God's image. And yet, in traditional Christian thought, humans are fallen from that ideal, from that relationship with God. We all are. And we need redemption and restoration to have peace with God. And plus, Catholic Christians emphasize this idea of original sin being passed down um, through humanity. But we have this wonderful good news of salvation that God, responsible for upholding the universe, became incarnate, became inhuman to help us, to redeem us, to save us. All right? And there's many of course more further elaborations on this this is not a theological lecture but somehow that the whole universe the whole world shares somehow in the benefits of this redemption brought in jesus christ 
who is God incarnate. Right? But how would this apply if there's extraterrestrial life? If there's life in other forms, on other planets, how would this apply? Um, 1 John says that Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Does that include the whole universe? Right? Some people think so, but do creatures beyond Earth sin? You know, this is something we don't know. Um, getting back to uh, the Catholic Church, uh, Father Denoya said that Christians have always understood that the entire cosmos is a creation of God, that any life anywhere is a divine creation, and there'd be no motive for scandal if scientists were to establish the existence of life elsewhere. And Father O'Collins said that he didn't think that the dis discovery of life on other planets would pose much of a different challenge than for Europeans when Europeans discover that, in fact, there are humans in the New World already existing here. It was a new world to Europeans, but it wasn't new to the people who already lived over here. Um, so it, it's kind of the same idea in his thought of recognizing that, in fact, there might be life already that God already knows about existing in other places. Not so fast, says Paul Davis, a, a physicist and, a, and, a, and philosophically minded scientist um, from Arizona. He said that, I think the discovery of a second genesis, meaning the idea that however life got started here, life started elsewhere as well, that would be of enormous spiritual significance and a challenge to Christianity. He says it's being downplayed. He thinks that the real threat would come from the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence. Because if there are beings elsewhere in the universe, then Christians must be in a horrible bind. They believe that God came incarnate in the form of Jesus Christ in order to save humankind, not dolphins or chimpanzees or little green men on other planets. Um, now, I kind of disagree with that. I think that uh, the incarnation has implications for dolphins and chimpanzees and little green women on other planets, but uh, that's his perspective. <laughs> And if you actually go to 15th and 16th centuries, people were thinking about this redemptive aspects already. All right, so uh, um, uh, uh, William uh, Forlong, Franciscan philosopher, said as to whether Christ, by dying on this earth, could redeem the inhabitants of another world, I would answer that he's able to do this, even if the worlds were infinite, but it would not be fitting because he'd have to do this and die over and over again, all right? So there's kind of a conundrum there. And then, of course, Giordano Bruno, who's a, a very flamboyant uh, Dominican friar, um, he was unabashedly sure that there must be life elsewhere. He said it's the, it's the excellence of God magnified and the greatness of his kingdom made manifest that he's glorified not in one but in countless suns, not in a single earth, a single world, but in a thousand, I say, in an infinity of worlds. Of course, he got burned at the stake, but... <laughs> wasn't for this exactly. All right. So let me just kind of uh, bring some of this to a close here. But the, there is more thought about this Catholic thought saying, well, actually, um, it might require some theological tinkering um, if we have to think about life on other uh, planets. We have to think about the difference between what Adam and Eve did and what's happened on other planets. But Father O'Collins said, anyone who thinks the doctrine of original sin is more important than Jesus being the original Savior, the universal Savior, already has their priorities out of line. All right, and that last line. In the end, they said, if there are extraterrestrials, Christians can state with confidence that they too are saved by Christ, even if the question of saved from what will take some reflection. All right? And Billy Graham, Protestant, great Protestant uh, 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 pastor and theologian and, and preacher, said, I firmly believe there are intelligent beings like us far away in space who worship God. But we have nothing to fear from these people. Like us, they are God's creation. And finally, C.S. Lewis. Uh, many of you know him as a great uh, Christian thinker and apologist. He was commenting on whether the discovery of life elsewhere would really disrupt the basis of Christian faith. 
And he said this is a warning as to what we might expect if we do discover what he called animal life or advanced life on another planet. He said vegetable does not matter, meaning if he doesn't think that if we found simple life elsewhere that it would be theologically all that significant. But he said each new discovery, every, even every new theory is held at first to have the most wide-reaching theological and philosophical consequences. Each new discovery is seized by unbelievers as a basis for a new attack on Christianity. But these discoveries are often and even more embarrassingly seized by injudicious believers as the basis for a new defense. But usually when the popular, popular hubbub has subsided and the novelty has been chewed over by real theologians, real scientists, and real philosophers, both sides find themselves pretty much where they were before. So it was with Copernican astronomy, with Darwinism, even with biblical criticism, and with new psychology. So I cannot help expecting it will be with the discovery on, of life on other planets if that discovery is ever made. Basically, he's saying, you know, people's foundational faith is not based on what we discover in the universe. So our responses are sometimes uh, to the universe, to the thought of life elsewhere, can range from bewilderment uh, to wonder, awe, praise of God, even loss of faith or increase of faith, feeling insignificant, feeling grateful, feeling curious. All of these are human responses, understandable. And as we pointed out the last couple of nights, I won't do it again because I'm out of time here, but, but Carl Sagan, in his quote, points out the sense of insignificance we can feel as we look at the universe and think about life filling it. Um, the psalmist has a different perspective that I share, that when we look at the heavens and we see the moon, stars, and now we know the galaxies and potentially the life that God has established, we can feel insignificant, we can wonder um, what are we that you are mindful of us, O oh God? And yet you have made us just a little lower than God and crowned us with glory and given us dominion, which I interpret as the gift of science, to study the work of your hands. You've put all things under our feet in this sense. The excitement I think we should have. Thomas Wright of Durham from the 18th century was contemplating this idea of there being many sons, not just our own son, but many sons with life in those solar systems. And he commented on this when he was reflecting on this idea that was in Milton's Paradise Lost. He said, and this is kind of his back of the envelope calculation here, if they had envelopes at that time, I guess they did. He said, now admitting, you know, he's thinking this through, thinking the breadth of the Milky Way, the Via Lactea, to be about nine degrees. And then he thought a little further. Supposing that only 1,200 stars in every square degree, and then he did a calculation, there'll be about 3,880,000 uh, 3, stars, and all of these, just a, a small amount of, of the vast expanse of heaven, so you'd have to extrapolate. And then it hit him. This is an enormous number of stars. He said, what a vast idea of endless beings must this produce and generate in our minds. And when we consider that all of these stars might be flaming suns, progenitors of life, of a still greater number of peopled worlds, wow, what less than an infinity can circumscribe them? What less than an eternity can comprehend them? What less than omnipotence can produce and support them? And our wonder cease. You see, I think that kind of excitement of realizing the vastness of the universe is an appropriate response for us. And we can always affirm as Christians that even though there are troubling questions about the history of, of, of our earth and the problems we have on earth, that the incarnation of God in from the universe is our hope. So with that, I'm going to that we need to remember the beauty and activity of the universe and remember that we do know there's life on one planet, right? Planet, And we can be good stewards and good caretakers and compassionate towards the life on our other planet. These two galaxies are merging together. They look like a rose with the rose petal and the rose stem. And so I leave you this as my parting gift. I'm so grateful for you inviting me into the lectures this week. 
Um, I can put up these resources later if you're interested in uh, interesting books or organizations when you're thinking about astronomy or science in general and faith. And uh, as we go on into Owen Gingrich's uh, remarks, I will just mention that many scientists have done their science out of great faith. Johannes Kepler, one of the great scientists who built the astronomy that we still build upon today, wrote in one of his books in 1619 a prayer. After he'd done his scientific analysis, he wrote this prayer, if I have been enticed into brashness by the wonderful beauty of thy works, talking to God, or if I've loved my own glory among men while advancing in work destined for thy glory, gently and mercifully pardon me, and finally, deign graciously to cause that these demonstrations may lead to thy glory and to the salvation of souls, and nowhere to be an obstacle to that. Let's affirm that prayer. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiseman, once again, for an illuminating and a very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, we appreciate it greatly. And now we are going to transition to Dr. Owen Gingrich, uh, who I know as he uh, is video conferenced in, he has a very creative response uh, to our time here together, and I think you'll enjoy it greatly. So we welcome uh, Dr. Owen Gingrich. third of them are pure fantasy set in the future, whereas two thirds, including a sequence about the UN, are real. And I leave it to you to decipher my story. I think I can safely say that I'm the oldest person who's ever addressed an audience at Gordon College. You see, I'll be celebrating my 200th birthday in just a few months. And I must explain how this astonishing longevity has happened. You will recall from your history books that the calendar was completely changed in 2035 after the horrendous nuclear explosion occurred that virtually wiped out Pakistan. We still don't know if it was an accident or an act of ter terrorism. We had always thought that Jerusalem would be a target, but that's not how it happened. Anyway, Gordon College remains a conservative Christian college, so the old ADBC system still holds here. And this year is AD 2129. Let me explain about why I got into NASA's Life Unlimited program. Back in 2016, astronomers discovered a planetary companion to a star visible in the southern hemisphere heavens, a faint companion to the first magnitude star, Alpha Centauri. It's in the constellation Centaurus, 4.2 light years away, the closest star to the sun. It was quite astonishing that a comparative neighbor to our sun has a climate comparable to the habitable zone in our solar system. Life is truly ubiquitous in the Milky Way galaxy. Then little Proxima B Centauri is a good place to explore. 4.2 light years seems like a pretty small number, a cosmically short distance, but such numbers are deceiving. I'm reminded of an opportunity I had about a century ago. At a conference sponsored by the UN, I agreed to speak on our imperiled environment. And not until about 30 minutes before I spoke did I realize that I would be addressing the General Assembly itself. It began, I'm holding in my hands two ball bearings, each one about two centimeters in diameter. Here at the United Nations headquarters in New York, I propose to build a model of our cosmic environment. This first 
sphere represents the sun. On this scale, the Earth would be about two meters away. You get the idea. Now, on this scale, the Earth is two meters away and it's much too small for you to see it. Mars, even smaller, would be another meter farther from the sun. On this scale, where would we place the second sphere representing the closest star to our solar system? On top of the Empire State Building or at JFK? Much too close. It should be placed some distance beyond Toronto. A few years later, the New Horizons spacecraft was la launched toward Pluto. And nine years later, it took a marvelous close-up picture of Pluto's surface. In my model solar system, Pluto was about the width of a football field from the sun. That's like nothing compared to the distance to Toronto. So in thinking ahead, for human trips to the stars, NASA launched its secret Life Unlimited program, deliberately to find out if some persons could live for centuries and hence could navigate to really distant targets, even though it would still take several generations born, bred and born in spaceships. So that's how, protected from germs of every kind, I've almost managed to get to my 200th birthday. But I seem to be getting old too soon, which is why I've been scrubbed from the program, which in turn is why I can be with you this afternoon. Believe me, it was pretty boring being locked up in a germ-free environment for a century, but I got a lot of reading done. Some are current events, particularly our scientific understanding, but some are also historical accounts. It was interesting to read that Johannes Kepler wrote in an imaginative fiction story how he was transported to the moon by a witch. This was not very helpful when his mother was accused of being a witch and was jailed until Kepler, armed with a lot of legal advice, came and got her released from her chains. Kepler allowed that he was simply interested to show his readers how the sun and earth would appear to lunar inhabitants who believed they were observing the sky from a fixed platform. Toward the end of the 16th century, Christian Huygens, the polymath who, among other things, discovered the rings of Saturn, wrote a brilliant account of a trip through the solar system. In his Cosmotheorist, he described the life he found on each planet. A century later, William Herschel, one of the greatest observers of all times, wrote that the dark sunspots were actually windows into a cooler, life-supporting, inhabited region of the cosmos, namely, inside the sun itself. His wiser colleagues urged him not to publish such crazy ideas. But still, by another century, the wealthy Boston aristocrat, Percival Lowell, and brother of Harvard's president Lowell, built his own private observatory in Arizona uh, to collect evidence for life on Mars. He thought he was observing an intelligently designed system of canals for bringing water to the parched equatorial regions of the Red Planet. His books were profitable sellers, but proved unconvincing to the overwhelming majority of professional astronomers. Since the time of Percival Lowell, scientists have learned a great deal about the biochemistry of life, and in particular, about DNA as a carrier of our genetic code. In retrospect, comparative simplicity of the 20 amino acids coded for by triplets of nucleic acids is completely awesome. 
so much so that it's been hard to imagine that there are alternative ways for this to be done. Now, in fact, these molecules are common enough that finding them in an alien world doesn't guarantee that life is or has been present. Nevertheless, it was long a dream that we are not alone in the cosmic system. Could we actually go to Proxima Centauri B? Could a few people live long enough to make the trip? Way back in 2016, an astrophysicist named Stephen Hawking signed on to a project with a fresh way to speed up probe to Proxima Centauri B. This was not a manned mission. The proposal was to miniaturize the payload to a cube one inch on a side and to have a huge nylon sail that could be hugely accelerated so that the spacecraft could reach its goal in 20 years. This assumed that the sail's propulsion could reach 20% of the speed of light. It would take another four years minimum for a return signal to make its way back to Earth and a pretty weak signal it would be. And what single specific piece of information would we like to get? It goes under the single word chirality, which means handedness. If you look at your gloves or your hands, you will see that each is a mirror of the other. Here on Earth, the amino acids that DA codes for all have a left-handed chirality. If in the laboratory you make up a batch of glycine, one of the amino acids that DNA codes for, it's always a mixture of left and right-handed molecules. But if we let life itself synthesize the glycine, on Earth, the glycine molecules are left-handed. If the glycine on Proxima Centauri B shows a distinctive chirality, this will be very suggestive that life is present. Nearly a century has passed since the discovery of Proxima Centauri B, and there hasn't been enough time for anyone actually to get there. Even a century isn't enough to have solved the chirality problem and its possible evidence for life on that exoplanet. Meanwhile, I've had a long time to think about the God problem. It doesn't make any difference whether we're thinking about two centuries, one century, or half a century. Why is God a problem? Because to us, God represents all that we are not. Infinity, endlessness, and the power to bring the universe with its vastness into being. While in contrast, we are finite and nothing by comparison. We only grasp dimly that we are in a universe with a history, that we share in discovery and creativity and understanding. If God speaks to us, and I believe God does, through the voices of prophets, of visionaries, of neighbors, and of strangers, but most powerfully through the man who chose to call himself God's son, Given this personal view of our place within the vastness of the universe, how are we to share this understanding with other possible life? You've just heard from the historical framework of my remarks that for several centuries, thoughtful astronomers have considered the possibility of other intelligent creatures within our solar system. Now, back to the present. Jennifer's lectures have opened a far vaster panorama of where life could survive. And Captain Kirk and his colleagues in Starship Enterprise have filled an artificial panorama with human-like creatures we could actually talk with. Now there's a huge difference between finding a planet with lichens growing on rocks and a non-human person-like spot. If we reach non-human persons, will they speak English? 
Will they even communicate with sound? As we look into our microscopes and our telescopes, are we just seeing ourselves? We have no idea how long technological civilizations can last. Our ability to send or receive radio signals into space isn't yet a century old. In my fantasy, I have envisioned a technologically oriented civilization outlasting a hor horrific nuclear, thermonuclear detonation by at least a century. But if technological civilizations last less than 500 years, the chance that we would be near enough to any communicating mm -hmm. life form would be so minuscule that we should abandon any dreams of getting in touch and concentrate on what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Had I seen Jennifer's talk before this afternoon, I would have included Psalm 8 which she has picked up from my translation of uh, Kepler's work. Uh, and I thought that was provided a very spectacular closing to a very wonderful kind of question, but one that we are very far from answering, even though we've found so many exoplanets. And thank you, Jennifer for your very interesting presentation. We thank Dr. Gant.